Dr. Pask, oh my goodness. I am so excited to speak with you. This is, this is preposterous. I can't believe we've never chatted before. I know, I feel exactly the same way. If you don't know me, I'm, I'm Forrest Galante. I'm a wildlife biologist who has specialized in critically endangered edge of extinction critters. Very unlike you, Dr. Pask, who's, who's specialized in fixing them. I just go out and look for them and usually fail. So give us a little introduction on yourself, please. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a professor at the University of Melbourne, and my primary thing that I do in my lab is work on the de-extinction of the Tasmanian tiger. So really trying to work on those technologies to bring animals back that have already gone extinct. I put up a little post on my YouTube going, hey, give me some questions for Dr. Pask. And I had a, a zillion comments come in, but I want to ask you a couple couple of them and get yep. your take on them. Does that work for you? Yep, let's go. Jesse Weldon asked, when will the complete genome be peer reviewed? Yeah, so we'll be publishing all of this next year. So it takes a while to actually get the, the full paper together. We have a lot of really depth uh, analyses, but that will be out next year for anybody who wants to download the genome, dig into it themselves, really interrogate all the data that we've got there. So you'll be able to do, do all of that at some time in 2025. So that leads me to the next question, which is from Lonely Hector 209 Hector said, how will they be raised after you successfully create one? Yeah. So, you know, those first animals that would be hand reared would never be the ones that you would release across the landscape because they just won't have that that same way of being uh, brought up and, and, you know, developing those cognitive skills, the, 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 you know, the way they need to think and hunt in the landscape. So those first animals, even, you know, the first few uh, animals would all be hand reared in captivity and then they would be used to produce that next generation of thylacines that would then be raised by thylacines in the environment. One of the things we know about particularly apex predators is they have very hardwired behaviours in their brain. They do innately know who to hunt, how to hunt. A great example of that is all our domestic cats at home. You know, these are animals that have been fed tin food for hundreds of generations, but you wiggle something in front of them and they reenact their pounce predator instantly, right? Animals know how to do that. The thylacine will know how to do that, um, but we'll be giving it that space and then really study um, how it interacts with the ecosystem in, you know, larger and larger outdoor areas before you would think about releasing it across the whole island. But that is the end strategy, is to get to the point where you completely rewild that animal again back into the landscape. So here's a good question that came from Nature Nut M8R. Will thylacine help control rabbit breeding in Australia? Which leads me to a second question, which is, yeah. Dr. Pass, do you think that thylacine will go back to mainland Australia, which we know went away about, about 4,000 years ago? Yeah. Or are we just looking at Tasmania? You know, initially, of course, it would be Tasmania, but I would love to see it back on mainland. We, there un, unequivocally would have incredibly positive benefits back on the mainland for rabbits, for excluding foxes and cats from some of our, you know, really precious areas where we have, you know, just fragmented groups of marsupials hanging on. It would be just, it's so much more in balance with the ecosystems that we have across even mainland Australia that it would be a really, really good species to have back. So I would be a massive advocate for that once we have these animals. Wesley Soros Rex asks, how will you prevent any kind of inbreeding or genetic bottlenecking when more than one of these Tasmanian tigers are brought back? Yeah, so we will be engineering a diversity from a large number of animals back into that initial population. So we'll recapture that genetic diversity, and that's why we're sequencing so, so many genomes. We also do have some DNA from mainland specimens, which, you know, as you said, they went extinct about 4,000 years ago. They're quite genetically different. So I think initially we'll actually be quite conservative with the amount of genetic diversity we put back in. We don't want to give them too much, but right. we're playing a, a delicate balancing game of wanting to put that animal back in, in balance with that ecosystem. So not, not too much diversity, but they've got to have enough to be really healthy as well. Last question here from Cameron Khan, which I think is a great question. What have been some surprising lessons you've learned from studying the thylacine's DNA and how could these discoveries help us protect today's endangered species? I think that one of the most surprising things is how far back you can go into museum collections and still find intact DNA, because that really opens up for us a whole plethora of species that are now viable candidates for, for de-extinction. And I think it really is going to change the way that, that we think about 
preserving our planet, preserving biodiversity. And it's certainly changing the way that we view museum collections now. You know, it used to be documenting the losses that we'd have in the past. Whereas now we view museum collections as being this incredible library that has all of this, this diversity, things that we've lost from the species today, in a way that we can access to help all of the species survive better in today's environment. Dr. Pass, thank you so much for your time today. Guys, if you're listening to this, if you're watching this, please be sure to subscribe to Colossal's YouTube channel for regular updates on the thylacine. And do yourself a favor and go and watch the new educational series, De-Extincting Tassie, because it's so exciting. It's so much fun. You get to learn so much more about Dr. Pask and everyone else's work. Dr. Pask, thank you again. Thank you so much.